Our next speaker is one of uh, two Robert Youngs that we have uh, with us uh, this conference. Uh, the other one is uh, Bob Young, and he wears a red hat. And this one is Robert Young Pelton, and uh, he goes to the world's most dangerous places, one of which could be this stage. <laughs> Come on up. Uh, hi, I'm uh, back again. Last time I was here, I talked about fun and dangers in Chechnya, Columbia, places like that. And I thought, since there's a Canadian theme, I have to find something related to what I do in Canada. And uh, yesterday morning, I was in Sierra Leone, in Freetown, in West Africa. And it suddenly struck me on the plane. Um, peacekeeping. So, let me tell you a little bit about uh, something that I'm fascinated with. Uh, for those who don't know, I write a book called The World's Most Dangerous Places. I go to war zones on a regular basis. I meet with rebels and bad people and good people, and I try to figure out what's going on, and I write it down in the book. And uh, the thing that never strikes me is the concept of peace, because I'm always in a place where they're shooting each other. So I had promised my friends in Sierra Leone that I was going to come out and visit them. And they had promised me wonderful things, you know, gunships and whatever. And for various reasons, one major thing being a motorcycle accident that laid me up for a while, I kept saying, well, I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. And they said, you better hurry up, you better hurry up. I said, well, no, I'm coming, I'm coming. Uh, so finally I got to go there about two and a half weeks ago. When I got there, they were just very upset because peace had broken up. <laughs> and I, <laughs> I've never been in a place where peace broke out. So I didn't quite know what to do. And uh, my friends are mercenaries. They, they used to work for a company called Executive Outcome. And they were just, they're South Africans, and they just, their hang, heads are hanging low. And they said, well, we'll have a party, we'll have a party. We'll, we'll figure something out, we'll figure something out. Our fighting will break out any moment now. <laughs> so I sat there thinking, oh, Christ, I'm in Sierra Leone and nothing's going on. So I thought, well, you know, the UN's here. And it dawned on me, it's the world's largest, most expensive peacekeeping operation in the world. So I thought, well, in between waiting for these guys to fire up their gunships and go do something, I'd go talk to the UN. And I entered a very interesting world. I, I had never really been exposed to the UN. A couple of times I'd bumped into people and I'd traveled with them and whatever, but this was full on, full press UN. There were 12,000 12, people inside the country. There were as you walk into this hotel, which was absolutely blown to hell, but the UN was paying $2 million a year to rent, there was an entire fleet of white four-wheel drive vehicles. It looked like Palos Verdes in California. And right in front were two absolutely brand new Mercedes S320s, UNAMSO 1 and UNAMSO 2. And I thought, wait a second, I'm in like the world's worst country. You know, Sierra Leone was the lowest on the quality of life indicator, according to the UN. And so I go inside and I meet the press representative. And she's going to set me up in all these junkets, and they're going to take me out to all different corners of the country, and I'm going to see peacekeeping in action. And she gave me some statistics, which, which I, in, in retrospect, they kind of blew my mind, because they're spending $500 million in one year in a country where the gross national product is only like $400 million. There's 12,000 people in a country that has an army with only like 4,000 people. There are an entire fleet of helicopters that'll take you anywhere you want to go at any time. They burn, the big ones burn 2,500 gallons of fuel an hour. And this is in a place that doesn't have gas stations. So it's like, I'm trying to get this into my head. So I, I did some research and I did some investigation and I found out that the UN doesn't actually do peacekeeping. It had to be invented. And does anybody here know who invented peacekeeping? That's yeah, in the, in the 50s, right. And there's no charter in the UN for peacekeeping. They have to kind of wedge it in. So every time something breaks out, they have to think, oh hell, we're the UN, we have to bring peace. How do we do that? Oh, what did Pearson do? Oh, okay, fine. So what they have to do is there's no standing army, there's no budget, there's nothing. There's not even a division that does peacekeeping. I met with the head of peacekeeping, and I asked him what he does. And he says, well, you know, whenever something happens and the two combatants want to do something, I have to go write a plan. I have to go to all the member states. I have to get money, I have to get soldiers, I have to get equipment, I have to go to all these different countries, and they have to kind of throw into the pot. It's like a potluck party. And then, 
by the time these people are all there, then I have to deploy the number of troops I have with the money I have into the region, which has now changed dramatically because it's four to five months later, and then I have to go keep the peace. And as you know, the UN got the stuffing kicked out of it in Somalia, so they didn't bother going into Rwanda. They were nervous about Bosnia. And when they had to go into Sierra Leone, they went in in a big way. Now, the other interesting thing I learned is that there are only five member nations that pay 70% of all the peacekeeping budgets. Most of the countries in the UN don't pay for peacekeeping. So this guy is literally on his knees. And the only people that get involved in peacekeeping are the ones that can make a profit. The UN allocates $1,000 per soldier on the ground. They give you $5 for ammunition. They give you, I think, $40 for a uniform, which is that little natty like blue beret. And the only countries that are interested are like Pakistan and Bangladesh, because they pay their soldiers like $100 a month. So they actually pocket $900 a month by sending their troops there. And then they get to rent their Cobras and their helicopters and the equipment. So you'll never see sort of a first world peacekeeping nation unless we have a political interest in there. And the second thing, it takes months, if not years sometimes, to these pe for these people to deploy. So in Sierra Leone, they had actually been prepared to fight a full-on war. And they had Ghanaians there, and they had uh, Guineans, and they had Pakistanis, and they had Indians, and they had Jordanians. And what had happened is that they had gone in waiting for a war, and they decided not to have a war. Now, if you know what happens in Sierra Leone, basically there's a rebel group called the RUF, the RUF as they call them. And they're the people that started back in 91 with 100 people. And their big slogan was, for the election, was give a hand to the election. And they're the ones that started chopping people's hands off because they thought that was funny. So they went to the country, and after, I think, between 10 and 12,000 people were mutilated, the Western world suddenly said, gee, we should do something about it, but we didn't. The people that did do something about it was a group of South Africans, and they created a company called Executive Outcomes, and Executive Outcomes are basically people from the 32 Buffalo Battalion that fought in Angola. And it's essentially black trackers from the Ohimba tribe with white, special forces soldiers that command them. They sent 80 people, and in four months, they had basically ended the war. But then what happened is that they signed a peace treaty, and one of the provisions of the peace treaty was to get rid of the South Africans because they were mercenaries. The second they did that, the country plunged back into warfare. So by then, the UN was kind of shamed, so they decided to do the same thing, except they need I think eventually be 17,000 troops to do the same job that 80 guys did. And the budget for the mercenaries was about, the total job was 36 million, of which the government only paid out 20 million. It was about a million to a month for these 80 guys. And we're about to spend two to three times the GNP of the country to fix it, even though it's already been fixed. In other words, the rebels just stopped fighting. Just before I got there, they decided that they'd finally discovered where the money was. It was in politics. So all the rebel leaders suddenly decided they were going to start a political party and run for office because they had been watching <laughs> these politicians. And they thought, wait a second, these guys don't live in the jungle. They don't eat rice. They, they drive around in fancy cars. And look at the money they make. So these rebels are now going to be politicians. And what the UN has done has basically said, OK, we're not going to punish any of you. We don't, no such thing as war crimes. Y'all come in settle things out, start it. We're going to have elections in December. And they basically brought peace to Sierra Leone by making the rebels rich. The other side of the coin, the other thing that fascinated me was what happens when 12,000 strangers descend on a little country? And I'd been to Cambodia after the UN was there. And I have never seen whorehouses on such a grand scale or bars where there are literally thousands, thousands of people drinking beer and gals with little sashes that fill your cup up and they say uh, Carlsberg and Bex and whatever. So I was fascinated to see what they were doing to the, in Sierra Leone. Well, in Sierra Leone, an apartment costs three times what it does in New York City. Now, that is hard to believe, because most of these places still have the roofs missing. But when the UN went in and they had to deploy all those people, everybody all of a sudden had a mansion that was worth a lot of money. That's the first thing that happened. Second thing is you can buy anything you want in Sierra Leone now. And it's provided because of the UN. So what happens is that the UN brings in supplies. They're flown by helicopter to small towns. The commander takes the beans and the rice off, gives it to the troops, and the rest he sells to the Lebanese. So now you've got what basically looks like Walmart in every single small town in Sierra Leone. The third thing is 
I've never seen so many beauty queens in Sierra Leone. Now the bars are full of girls between the ages of, let's say, 15 to 25, all waiting for the UN to come in. So they've changed a country from one that was devastated to basically a resort town. And the beaches are lined with bars full of you know, white guys with tattoos drinking beer. And I didn't know if this was good or bad or not. I just, I had really had a hard time figuring out whether peacekeeping works that way. But I go back to the, I'm not trying to be funny, I'm just trying to figure this out and you're gonna help me because I went back to the original goal of peacekeeping and it dawned on me that we always talk about how bad things are, how they should be changed and then I always criticize people for not sort of standing up and wanting to, to say, okay, fix that, change that. And then I realized there's no mechanism for that. So what I thought I would suggest, and I'm not a politician or a journalist, but what I would suggest is why couldn't Canadians come up with a mandate to have some peacekeeping mechanism? So when something happens and people want to fix it, there's actually something in place. And the spectrum goes all the way from what they call private military corporations, PMCs, which are groups like Sandline, uh, like MPR. These are companies that basically provide soldiers and tanks and weapons that can go in on an, on an offensive basis and clear things up to the United Nations, which is just now trying to figure out how to get a standing army and how to do rapid deployment into areas that are falling apart. And there's no movement in the States for this. The head of the peacekeeping wants it, but he can't find much support for it because People are whining about the cost and everything, but I think it'd be interesting to start the germ of that idea. When we see something, like a Rwanda, where things are starting to go over the edge, and all it takes is maybe 50 to 100 people to simply put in security, why don't we have a rapid deployment force? And it can be apolitical, it doesn't have to be from a country, it can be through the UN. And can we also recognize the evils of the UN when they go into these places with tens of thousands of people, with thousands of luxury vehicles, and realize that we warp those cultures beyond recognition. Uh, the UN has a really bad habit of changing these countries into very sort of striated zones of wealthy and poor. They also have a bad habit of creating camps. One of the major reasons for conflict in Sierra Leone now is kicking people out of camps. Because the idea of showing up and getting free stuff was very unusual for them. Normally, if a village gets blown up, people go off in the jungle and have to fend for themselves. When the UN came and the NGOs under them, they could actually go to a camp and eat and sleep and stay there for free. And that idea has created entire tent cities of people who are completely healthy, who really have no reason not to go back to the villages, but it just seems like a good idea to get stuff for free. The third thing it's created is, a, is a, an economy of the black market, where people go in to make money just from the amount of money that the UN brings into the country. And what that does is it alienates the people from their natural sort of shops and stores and hotels and things like that. So things like gas, outrageously expensive, uh, cheap things that should be cheap like rice are just blown off the map because now you have free UN rice, which means that you can't really grow rice because you can't sell it to anybody. Uh, mundane things like, uh, I don't know, shoes disappear because you can get free shoes, you can get free juice, you can get all these things that fall off the back of trucks. And so what happens is that the little guys, the local economy, ceases to exist. And the third thing is that they actually restructure the entire country because they pull people from areas of conflict where they should be going back to rebuild. They're now in another area getting free stuff while the people there are now living in their houses and growing things on their land and marrying their daughters. So when these people go back, they find out that their house is full of somebody living there and that they don't really belong there anymore, which creates another element of uh, conflict. So I just wanted to run those ideas by you. And I wanted to let you know that Sierra Leone is safe. You can go there, it has beautiful beaches. It has beautiful, beautiful scenery. I'm, I'm not kidding, honest to God. The place is full of amazing things. Um, I went out to an island and uh, it, it was the most pristine thing I've ever seen. It was just these little African huts and people fished out there. And for two beers, you can buy a giant fish and you can barbecue it, sit out there. And for the first time in my life, I was in a war zone that wasn't a war zone. And I was really having a hard time enjoying myself. But I really, I thought, <laughs> no, I, I don't mean it that way. I mean, I, I just had these things I had to do and, and I couldn't do them. But I'll tell you a little funny story. So now peace breaks out. Now there's a group called the Kamajors, and I have to tell you this because this is fun. 
These are mystical hunters. You know, they have secret societies in Sierra Leone. And certain people are initiated into this group called the Kamajor. And the idea is that you become invisible. You can deflect bullets. There's all these magical things that can happen. So I went and talked to the head of defense. He said, you have to meet my Kamajors. They're the, they're the people that are going to bring peace to this country. So I fly out there. They want 200 bucks. OK, fine. So I pay him 200 bucks. We need guns. OK, another $100. OK, fine. Guns, people, here we go. And they change out of their t-shirts and their Nikes, and they get into their little mystical hunter things. And the first thing they say is, OK, let me explain how this works. I have a controller. And the controller makes the bullets, if you hold it up, it makes the bullets go up. I said, what happens if you drop it? Well, then the bullets go down. But you have to pick it up because you want the bullets to go up. OK. So what happens if you hold the controller here, and there's a guy over there? He said, oh, he has his own controller. OK. So you have the controller. Then you have these little pouches. And these pouches make you bulletproof. Now, these pouches have, well, they're supposed to be livers of your enemies and things like that. But I'm asking them, well, what happens if your pouch is over here and the bullet goes here? He said, oh, what I have is a shutdown. I said, shutdown? What's a shutdown? Well, that's another thing I have, that if I hold this up, it shuts down all the guns. Nobody can fire. Every gun just goes silent. I said, wow. So I said, and how do you know where your enemies are? Oh, well, I wear this band. And this band gets tight as I get closer to the enemy. OK. Now, they're deadly serious. They're really, really serious about this. I said, OK, now show me what you do. I want to see how you fight the battles. And uh, I'm going to film this, and this will be good. So they start off, and they speak this funny kind of English, 18th century English. And he goes, gentlemen, advance. And he holds this little <laughs> thing up this. And he's saying, no. They are firing, and the bullets are going over our head. I said, OK. And what's he doing? He, he's invisible. OK. But, <laughs> no, but I can see him. Oh, but he's invisible to the bullets. OK, OK. So they advance. Then they have a guy who's playing the enemy. And they attack on him. And they, he falls on the ground. They dance around him. And they immediately start torturing him. I say, well, what is that? Well, that's what we do. And I say, but no, no, that's not good. It's, you just have to win. You don't have to torture the guy. OK, well, let's do an ambush. OK, so we do an ambush. And this guy, he's got his little band, right? He's walking, oh, tightens up. Guy in the bushes. They grab this guy and immediately start torturing him. I'm like, no, no, no. <laughs> so I said, let's try something else. Let's, um, let's try, you know, I'm driving down the road and you jump out and surprise me. OK. Drive down the road. I'll jump out of the bushes. First thing they do, they want to throw me in prison to torture me. And I'm like, no, you know, this is not working because I came out here to show how you guys are going to bring the peace if you torture these people. So we're not torturing him. We're going to eat his liver, but we can't do that. So we thought we'd just like poke him and beat him. I'm like, what do you mean, eat his liver? And he's like, well, that's what we need to be invisible. And I'm like, oh, Christ, this is never going to work. So <laughs> I, I kind of gave up on the Kamajor as, as um, what I thought would be the salvation of uh, Sierra Leone. And it so happens that when I get back into Freetown, I ask the British Army, well, how will you ensure peace? Because, you know, the British Army was kidnapped, which is not a very glamorous thing. And I said, oh, we were relying on the Kamajors. <laughs> uh, oh, OK. I said, but we're training them. OK, so if you want to see this training exercise, OK, great. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to have a firepower demonstration. And we're going to show these Africans how these things really work. And he says, you watch. When a, when a Brit uses their stuff, they're really impressed. So OK, fine. I go there. Well, they're not going to have a fire term. They don't really have enough ammunition to do a live fire. But they're going to cross a river for me. OK, so. so I don't know if you've been to Africa, but basically Africans don't swim. So what they've done is they've taken these poor guys and they put these yellow water containers to make floats. <laughs> so they look like kids with their little butterfly wings, which is not very camouflaged. <laughs> they had a rope across the river. Half of them refused to go in the water. They would not go in the water. And this is the trained group. This is not the beginning one. So the British do whatever the British do to get people to do things they don't want to do. And <laughs> These intrepid soldiers start off. First of all, they take off all their kit because that's too heavy and they don't want to drown. And they get into the water. The first four go directly under the water until, <laughs> until their little buckets hold them up and push their face in the water. And the British are sitting like this, you know. And one guy says to the other guy, you know, I think he's drowning. <laughs> well, they go charging into the water of the fishing boat. And these poor guys, they don't even know they're drowning. They just have their face in the water. There's an oxygen. So pull them up, like, <gasps> OK, bring it back to shore. 
the next group starts, let's go on the rope in panic and starts floating down the river. And they're like, okay, we have to rescue those people. Okay. Now, the British Army doesn't want to admit that things aren't going very well. So they're saying, okay, good, good, good. This is, this is, this is good. This is training, you know? Because without these training, you imagine what it'd be like. You know? Okay. So another group gets in the water, gets halfway across, and freezes and just stays there. And these little guys are bobbing up and down in their little uh, water bottles. And the next group gets blocked up in the middle of the river. And I say, well, what's the objective of this? Oh, it's a, it's a, it's a surprise attack on the enemy. <laughs> so even though I, I have to admit that I was very disturbed that peace broke out, I don't think it'll break out for too long. So <laughs> what I'd like you to do is come up with that solution for me. Because I think whether, I don't think the UN's going to come up with it by themselves. So I think the Canadians, it's on your consciences to come up with a concrete peacekeeping plan so that when things do happen in these parts of the world, we can go and fix it. And that'll probably be the last peaceful place I'll be in for a while. So um, that's really all I have to say. So thank you very much.